Hi, my name is Jennifer Friesen, and I am presenting today on the impact that induction of labor has on cesarean rates. In the United States from 1990 until 2017, the rate of induction increased from 9.5% to 25.7%. In 2017, the rate of cesarean was 32%, which interestingly, it's very high compared to other, um, other countries that are also developed, but it's actually been decreasing very slowly over the past decade. Uh, mothers report being uh, feeling pressured by clinicians to accept induction or cesarean. Uh, and among those who felt pressured, the incidence of cesarean and other interventions for no medical reason was far higher than that <clears throat> of women who did not feel that their practitioner had pressured them. Um, and there was a much higher incidence of labor resulting in unplanned cesarean. So recently, previous conceptions about the relationship between induction of labor and cesarean is being questioned. Multiple factors come into play about the relationship and the previously assumed causative relationship is, is not really a given anymore. The research here examines the current understanding of the relationship between induction of labor and cesarean rates. Um, we're taking into, consider, into consideration a variety of diverse factors, including the method of induction, the indications for induction, methods of predicting whether the induction will be successful, and risk mitigation. <clears throat> the relevance is, for the most part, I think pretty obvious. We want to support the decision-making process. A better developed understanding of the impact that induction has on cesarean rates can facilitate risk benefit analyses between clinicians and patients, potentially reducing the subjective clinician pressures. Um, it can support couplet health. Vaginal delivery has been associated with higher breastfeeding success, shorter maternal physical and psychological recovery. Um, better neonatal blood sugar, breathing, temperature regulation. Additionally, um, having a cesarean introduces the risk of postoperative infection, injury to organs, internal adhesions, hemorrhage, blood loss, um, even the inability to deliver in future pregnancy and maternal mortality. Um, finally, we have a financial responsibility. With the exception of a small group of women, um, including those that have a uterine scar from previous um, cesarean, vaginal delivery is significantly more cost effective. I chose this topic because at the time the class began, I was pregnant and my provider had suggested that we induce labor early with my darling Viola, who was born one week early via induction of labor. I created the fishbone to generate some ideas about the topic and then developed the question, among pregnant women, how does induction, <coughs> pardon me, how does induction compared to expectant management affect cesarean rates at the time of delivery? So I searched Sinal, EBSCO, and the Cochrane, and I started with the terms induction of labor and cesarean, and then I used a few different <clears throat> variations of the terms and spelling. The findings were surprising to me. Consistently, induction of labor was not associated with an increased rate of cesarean as an independent risk factor. Uh, with the exception of women who have never given birth before. It was actually associated with a reduced risk of cesarean, and it is believed, uh, or it was posed as a belief in many of these studies that the association was due to failure of the researchers to correct for demographics, um, and, and specific, specifically parity was a big one that was not corrected for. Um, additionally, cervical ripening agents um, 
using prostaglandins, balloon dilatation, laminaria, or a membrane sweep was shown to be very effective and to have a reduced rate of um, cesarean compared with expectant management. <coughs> Pardon me. Uterine stimulation through use of Pitocin um, and also a rupture of membranes or amniotomy um, was also found to not be associated with an increased risk of cesarean, but there were uh, significant side effects frequently with these and, and other problems associated with it. Uh, the amniotomy specifically, there wasn't a whole lot of data on how it impacts cesarean rates, mostly because it's usually coupled with other methods of induction because it's not very effective alone. Frequently, it's found that the uh, indication for a cesarean, I'm sorry, for an induction outweighs the risk. So the belief here is that if there's an indication for an induction, then whatever that, that problem is, is going to worsen with time. So the hope for an induction is that it gets the baby out safely prior to that problem becoming so big that a cesarean is necessary. Many methods have been proposed as a way of determining whether or not the uh, induction is going to result in a vaginal delivery be successful. And ultimately, it's, it's not really clear as to whether or not those are all that um, successful as, as a tool for determining whether or not an induction will be successful or if it will ultimately have to result in a cesarean. Um, risk factors and mitigation. The biggest thing was multiparity is uh, a great way of mitigating your risk. However, if you haven't had a kid before, you can't really do anything about that. Epidural use is a big one. Um, weight gain prior to and through pregnancy is, is an indicator of um, an, an unhealthy rate of weight gain uh, has been associated with a higher likelihood of cesarean, uh, maintaining physical activity, and being upright and ambulatory through the first stage of labor are all ways that you can mitigate the risk of cesarean. For people who um, have an induction or not. So the recommendations. The first thing is to improve communication. Many of the risk factors cannot be addressed at the time of labor. So the practitioner and the patient need to have these conversations up front. The provider needs to be honest with women and say, if you gain weight at an unhealthy rate, it's going to increase this risk. Additionally, the mothers need to say, I do not want unnecessary interventions, and they need to be upfront about that. And if they feel that their clinician doesn't agree or is going to pressure them, they need to find somebody who's better suited to their needs. Um, induction has been associated with other negative outcomes besides cesarean, and therefore clinicians should offer induction only for a clear evidence-based indication, particularly for prima paras who appear to be most at risk. Designing a policy to prevent cesareans for induction, especially with the increasing rates of induction, but then also for the general population. Um, in one of the articles I read, they discussed some uh, policies that would really help, like having audit and feedback cycles, education, and a hard stop requiring a second opinion prior to non-emergent cesarean. And then in many facilities, there's limited pain control options. And an epidural, I think, in America is something that we're very familiar with. So birthing facilities should have diverse pain control options to decrease the impact that the significant risk factor has on cesarean. So this is my list of references. And if anybody has any questions, because I'm not there to answer them, please feel free to email me through my OKCU email <coughs> or many of us are on a Facebook page for the class. Uh, feel free to contact me however you feel the most comfortable and I would be happy to forward you my findings. Thank you for your time.